Always a pleasure, my friend. Always a pleasure. Right. So why do we want that? Doug, how you doing? I'm, I'm here.
Good afternoon. This is the City of Madeira Beach. This is our uh, special workshop meeting, and it is uh, Tuesday, February 25th at 2 p.m. May I have the um, City Clerk take the roll call, please? Mayor Black. Vice Mayor Hodges. Here. Commissioner Weinstein. Here. Commissioner Andrews. Here. Commissioner Douthert. Present. The next section on our agenda is for public comments. This is to encourage everyone to speak. Um, if you feel free to come to the podium, please do. We do anticipate your name and address and uh, any remarks you need to make. So at this time, I am opening it up to public comments. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Is it on? I don't know. I can You're good. Uh, 13025 Pelican Lane. I was very, very concerned over the years about having two parking for the citizen of Madeira Beach, right here at City Hall, with one hour parking only. Because uh, you see the, the, the snowbirds coming down, they're taking over all the parking and go playing game or whatever they're playing there, and somebody comes to get a permit or something, they, they don't have no parking, they have to walk far away or they have to go win Dick's parking lot. I don't think it's fair for a citizen of Madeira Beach to don't have a two parking for one hour parking right here at City Hall. Thank you for. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak publicly? Okay, at this time I will close that part of the agenda. The next item on the agenda is for open uh, the topics for discussion. And the first one is the Sheriff's Office Report. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, usually your CPO give the report, but I was talking with the city manager. I haven't been here in a while, so I know a few of you and a few of you are newer than the than last time I was here. So we talked about me coming down and giving the uh, report and see if you had any questions or anything I can answer while I was here. So regarding the monthly report, obviously that first one that's going to jump on our first page is the uh, murder. Uh, it's, I think this, there needs more, more explanation. So what this is is driven from UCR data, which is Uniform Crime Reporting Data. And what that's required is us to report stuff to the federal agencies, so everything's kind of uniform, hence UCR. The interesting thing about it is that in order for every all the states to be the same, some of the things get squeezed into similar categories. In this case, just so you all know, it, it's an open case. We're still investigating, so I can't get into the details of it at this point. However, UCR data makes no differentiation between whether it was a felony murder where somebody intentionally killed somebody um, just outright, no provocation or anything, versus a uh, justifiable homicide where somebody may be coming into your house trying to attack you or your kids or something. It's always going to show murder on this report. So hopefully that explains some of that. But I can tell you that it is an investigation now that I can't really give them any more details on it. Uh, moving along to the robbery, that actually occurred. Captain, there's no reason for alarm, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, it, I can tell you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. It was two acquaintances, both two acquaintances, one of which took the life of the other uh, at a private residence. So there's nothing for your citizens to be fearful of or anything in that sense. But it is something we still have to look into. And it, as you can imagine, it does take a lot of investigation and examination. Thank you very much. Uh, so the robbery happened over at the uh, Winn Dixie, and what that was, it's called robbery by sudden snatching. It was a 16-year-old kid fell off his bike, another 16-year-old kid grabbed the necklace and snatched it off his uh, off his neck. Um, the, they put a bolo out for the car, and they saw the, another deputy saw the car going down 102nd and Ridge Road, stopped it, and they were able to arrest the subject or the suspect, I should say. So that one was closed with the rest. The aggravated assault back to my lovely UCR data that is actually related to a domestic battery. And it's listed in here when we get to the report. It's a domestic battery by strangulation. A couple years ago, they had added that. So if you actually try to say, strangle somebody, they added that as a higher level. That's what that's related to. But that was closed with the rest as well. So it's not like you have someone going around doing that. And then as you get into your larcenies, I know this has been explained in the past, like, but I know some people still have lots of questions. They ask me about it. 
In the state of Florida, burglary to a residential is a felony burglary to a car. We consider a car, entering into a car, a burglary. So part of the statute in Florida is entering or remaining in a structure or conveyance with the intent to commit a crime. That's a burglary. So to us, there's burglary residential, burglary to a car. When they take the UCR data and cram it all together, when you get on your burglary, burglary is only residential. Larceny captures your pettit thefts, your, your, your shoplifting theft and all that, in vehicle burglaries. So when you see your larceny here, it's not like uh, you had seven of them last month. It's not like seven people went into 7-Eleven or, or, or like I said, Winn-Dixie and stole something. You could have vehicle burglaries where somebody went in and stole a wallet. That'll be in your larceny report. So out of those seven that you had, um, one, was, uh, one was actually 7-Eleven. And some, a lady, 36-year-old lady, had gone in there and was putting stuff in her pockets. And you know you have the crates in there to carry stuff, but she said it was a mistake. She couldn't carry everything. So she was arrested for that. They called and wanted to prosecute. Um, one of these ones, like I said, larceny was a burglary to a conveyance. Goes in as a larceny. That was at John's Pass. Someone left their car unlocked um, in a three-hour time span on the fourth floor and left their wallet sitting there and a bag full of tennis rackets in the back. So unfortunately, somebody came by and helped themselves to that. That's still open. Um, the first shoplifting I told you was closed with arrest. Another one was another UCR data thing. It was actually a supplement to where the deputy made the error, so it shouldn't come on your report. They cleared it as something, and they sh it got changed after this report was done. So we fixed it, but it's not on your, on your data. It shouldn't be on your data. If you go down to the 667, that was a... Uh, that's an interesting one. That was another shoplifting. An individual went to the Madeira Beach pub and had a draft beer, which cost them $3.44. Then they told the bartender, I don't have the money. So the bartender was like, took back the rest of the beer. At that point, he said he was calling the cops. That was what he said. So this gentleman, instead of paying his $3.44 tab, leaves there, runs next nearby to the surf style, reaches in, grabs a sweatshirt because he knows what they, he was wearing at the time when the guy called for a $3.44 tab. Uh, throws on this gray hoodie, takes off, but the deputies arrive and get him. So that was the biggest caper there. Uh, another one, the uh, 33910 was at Coors Family uh, Custard. That involved an employee theft and they did not want to prosecute. They were going to handle that internally. And then I think the sixth one out of your seven was it's listed as a grand theft. An individual that the report says was highly intoxicated had left their wallet on their dresser for $1,200 and it turned up missing, but couldn't show that they ever had the $1,200 and a lot of contradictory information there. That one technically is closed without further leads. So, um, and the final one you came under your larcenies was a residence. Um, I think it was over on Third Street, Third Ave or something. But it was a residence where a gentleman had wrapped up a $100 rug that he was going to mail. Um, he put it out by the mailbox. And before the mail person could get there, somebody came by and took it. Uh, we don't have any leads on that. So those were your larcenies. That's the first page. Anybody's questions on those? Or? I would just like to ask a question, if I may. It's sure. just a common question. It's regarding the, um, it was over on, um, Sure, I believe, and this happened a couple of weeks ago where the one individual assaulted another individual and that person was killed. All day long that road was closed. Is this a normal procedure to be closed, that whole area, for as long as it was? I mean, it was all day. Yeah, depending, on, depending on the crime scene, and I think in that thing there was a crime scene there. We had a couple crime scenes. So if they have stuff that they have to process, it could be closed substantially. We obviously want to open as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, let's say hypothetically you had something where somebody was fleeing from some type of scene and they were dropping all kind of evidence. Evidence in and of itself is easy to process, take a picture and move on type deal. You start dealing with other DNA type evidence, that's a little longer to process. So we make all attempts to obviously get it done and get out and open up traps as quickly as possible. But it is possible. Because I remember that time it was Miramar was closed, and also uh, Bayshore was closed, and it was an all-day thing, yeah. and I was just curious about that. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it, certain things you have to be meticulous on. So they'll make sure they get everything done, but it's not like, let's close it for six hours because we need it for 15 minutes. As soon as it's clear, we'll clear it and get out, and we're not dragging things along. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then just on your net, a lot of these are related to what I told you on your next page with the arrest. You had 10 people arrested. Your shoplifting one was the Mr. Draft Beer Surf Shop guy. The possession of controlled substance was a traffic stop, which leads you into the one of the two possession with intent to sell. That was the same traffic stop. And the other possession with intent to sell was a, another traffic stop. The good thing out of all this, those for the, those three right there, because your deputies are out there, one of them was somebody was speeding up Golf Boulevard, so they stopped them. The other one was in the neighborhood, but it was a, a tag, expired tag. So your deputies are out there patrolling, doing their job is what it comes down to. The robbery by Sunday snatching, I told you about it, closed with the rest of it, Winn-Dixie with the chain. The disorderly intox, some individual was visiting the city at the sandbar, um, had too much to drink, was spouting off, the kids were across the street at the, uh, uh, the ice cream store. So when somebody confronted him, say, keep it down, he decided to urinate on the front porch of the sandbar and walk off, so we caught him. So they called deputies, we got by and got him. The Pettit theft shoplifting was a 7-Eleven where she didn't have a basket and put it all in her pockets. Uh, now the possession of drug paraphernalia was a call that we went to the Schooner Hotel and um, somebody had a pipe on them, so it wasn't a huge to do. It was just an ancillary arrest while we were there. Trespass after warning involved a mom that did get, with her, get, get along with her son. He had been trespassed from a property. And he would not leave. And the violation of probation, as you would um, amazingly, the juvenile that stole the necklace at Winn-Dixie was on probation, so he got violated. Uh, the one warrant arrest wasn't a huge one. It was for a DUI failure to appear, and that was because we got called to John's Pass for a couple of loud people, a couple of people talking loudly. And then your DUI, your driving under the influence, was a, bull, a bulletin, or a bolo, be on the lookout for, where the person was in another city, was trails, going through your all city, and we saw him and stopped him, and he turned out to be DUI. So those are all your arrests for the month. The other stuff's a real quick one. That just captures all the activity because obviously sometimes we'll get questions on what are the deputies doing. As you can see, there are a lot of it's traffic stops. You got a lot of construction going on and stuff. We're trying to make sure the residents are obviously safe and all the visitors as well. So that's the number one thing right now. You're doing your checks. The ordinance violations are kind of up a little bit in your directed patrol. So the good thing here is that they're staying busy when they're not answering these calls for service. And then the final one, I was happy, actually happy to see you only had six crashes in the entire city. Um, typically, with all the construction you got on, the, the cars that come across the causeway and up and down Gulf, I think that I would expect that to be higher. Um, but it's always nice to see it was only six. There's nothing, there was nothing major out of them all. It's just so you can see the break out of days versus nights. And then you can see where we're writing the citations. Most of the citations or warnings and all that are addressed at the locations where the crashes are occurring. So there's nothing there. Where we would get something is, let's say, uh, you had 150th in golf and you had 15 crashes. We would dive down in that data and say, when's this occurring? We need to put something. What's going on? What changed? But here you have one here, one there, one there. And that is pretty much that report. And here if you got any questions. Ma'am. I would just like to know the uh, status of, the, um, of our ordinance 2019-21, which was that uh, regulating the use of liveaboard vessels. Do you have any reports, any statistics, any anything further on that? Or what are you doing to start enforcing it? Or We did, since it's passed, they were doing education to begin, and then it rolled into violations. Um, what we have learned, well, there's two things. Well, we've, we've done a whole bunch of patrols, and I can get data to the city manager on that. I haven't run a Okay, report. I would appreciate that. Um, obviously, number one is make sure we're in the area doing our job. So I get my people to make sure we're in the area doing the job. So I've confirmed that, and I can get you the report so you have it. But what we've learned over it all, you obviously have the liveaboard. I think to date, there's only the one I know about that's really the true liveaboard. What we're really encountering is the at-risk vehicles and the derelict vehicles, and what we're what we're encount what's happening is. We're enforcing the ordinance for the liveaboard. At the same time, we come across these other at risk or whatever, and when we put the pressure on them, they're moving to the unincorporated area. So they'll go out of, is it Snug Harbor? I can't, 
they'll move to, there's one in here, they moved in front of a C condos or something, C towers that it's no longer technically in your water. Now, that's a bigger picture. The county's already had a meeting on this. I wasn't in attendance at that, but so this, what it is, like anything else, the cities all have these ordinance and it keeps pushing, pushing the, the balloon, the air in the balloon. The county's looking at it as well. So you could have something that's in Madeira Beach waters. That's a violation. Our marine is going out and enforcing it for the livable board. And then they're moving it to the county where the livable board ordinance isn't. So it needs a, it needs a countywide response to which they're working on right now. But after all that, there's only one livable board, true livable board that I got, I have in my data. The other ones have been like the at risk and those are the ones or the abandoned ones, the derelict ones. And that's where you start getting all the money. So that's kind of where we're at with it. Okay. Well, it seems like um, I haven't counted them, but it seems like there's a few, a few less ones. Okay. And the waters um, off the Tom Stewart causeway to the, uh, to the South of the causeway. And I was just curious if they moved on their own, if they moved because y'all had, um, you know, begun an investigation or told them they needed to or given them a citation for that 118 bucks if they didn't come to City Hall and pay their $5 to begin with. And I was just curious if, if that, if they're doing it on their own or if y'all are doing it. I could give you this update on these seven I have here because that's probably what everybody has the questions on. Uh, there was one in Hurricane Hole, which I guess is south of the Tom Stewart Causeway. Uh, it was a derelict vessel. The gentleman was elderly in an ALF. So they worked with him. He signed a voluntary removal letter by the end of the week. This is back. This is this week. So we're working with him to try and get permission to get it out of there without, because the guy's in, in ALF. Uh, there's another derelict vessel where we issued a notice to appear back last October. Um, like I said, this is everything I told him to send me. He's fighting that, in, he's fighting that one in court. So that's going to be the prolonged one. And that's in Hurricane Hole. Third one's in Hurricane Hole. Uh, we sent notify with the sort of that's in the process of the certifi certified letters went out. So that's an open case right now. The one live aboard that they noted on here was north of Tom Stewart. It was near the Rex Place area, and I apologize, I'm, I'm not a voter. So <laughs> near the Rex Place area, they were cited under Madeira, the Madeira, Madeira Beach Ordinance on February 2nd. And the, this is the one where the owner moved the vessel east near the Sea Towers Cove, which is unincorporated. Technically, the owner on the live aboard ordinance is in compliance. Uh, there was another an, another at risk one. In fact, it seems like this hurricane hole is pretty popular. Hurricane hole, an at risk one. They got a citation on February second. Uh, There's another derelict vessel. We're trying to contact that owner. And then the final one I have is another at risk one. I think it's all in hurricane hole, um, where they issued a citation, they didn't pay it, so there was a warrant issued and the person was arrested. So right now they've summed it up, they said there's a total of four active derelict vessel cases being worked and in which vessels will be removed once the cases are closed. So there, I can just tell you, and, I, and, I, and I, I don't know a lot about boats and I never worked in marine unit, so I have to rely on their stuff. I just saw the data that I know they're out there doing it. Captain, I think we'll all agree the real crime here is having to pay $3.44 for a draft beer. Huh? Hey, I was like, hey. <laughs> um, I like that. Now, with that segue, hey, Bob, you know, I, I, I don't know if this is the time to bring it up, and I may be out of line even suggesting it, but um, I know you had a conversation with um, one of the captain's deputies, uh, Deputy Bryant Duncan, about the unity tour. Um, were you going to bring that up in your notes at the end, or...? I'd, I'd plan, but we can talk about it now. Um, do you want yeah, me to I mean, it, it's probably it a two-minute conversation. I just wanted to bring it up, especially with these guys here. Um, all I can say is, you know, I've known, I've known Deputy Duncan uh, since I bought the store, so roughly about eight years. And uh, if you all don't know him, that's a good thing because all the wrong people do know exactly who he is. And every time they put him on a special assignment off the beach, everybody gets excited. And then when he's coming back, it's everybody falls back into line again. So uh, great guy. I'll let, you know, Bob, you can explain the unity tour if you'd like and um, kind of what we're looking to do. Sure. Uh, the unity tour actually takes place from uh, Portsmouth, Virginia, uh, to the Washington, D.C. National Law Enforcement Memorial uh, back 
probably it's 20 years now, uh, the, the federal government created a memorial for fallen law enforcement officers. So either they were killed while they were on duty, either by a, a motor vehicle accident, or they were uh, obviously shot or uh, somehow injured and succumbed to their injuries. Um, and the actually the memorial I got the update is they're running out of room on the wall space. So they're even looking at building a, a newer memorial apparently. But anyhow, getting back to uh, the, the deputies, uh, two of which that are on the team work right here uh, in uh, Madeira Beach. And uh, they go up, they have to raise $2,000 each to go on this trip, and it's all for charity. The money goes to the Law Enforcement Memorial, which is a 501c3. And uh, so they go up and they do this ride. I think it's 297 miles, uh, give or take a few. Uh, but uh, it's really amazing what they go through, um, and they culminate that ride usually around Law Enforcement Memorial Day, which is May 15th every year. Uh, President Kennedy was the one that uh, started the process of having a law enforcement memorial day. So uh, hats off to, to your team, and uh, we are uh, getting the information, but it's not on the website now. We will have some information on the website. We're even looking at doing some challenges within City Hall, the employees, and uh, one of them's gonna be like a chili cook-off challenge where you, know, you pay a buck for a vote and the money goes to the, uh, to the team. So we're looking at doing little things like that, but uh, you know, hats off to your guys and, and your deputies that work our streets. Uh, you should be very proud of them, Captain. You know, all I get is compliments. Uh, the speeding, we're always gonna have speeding here and there. It's an intermittent type thing, and I, I realize that, but uh, overall they're very professional, and I appreciate the uh, communication that we get, uh, not only out of you, but also your deputies. I do appreciate the comment, the positive comments on deputy. Typically, where I'm at, I'll get all the bad stuff. So, but when we do, like I said, we obviously. I don't complain too much. No, no, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm not pointing you now. Um, we do appreciate the relationship we have with the city, especially just like things like that, where you're helping support our, our deputies do things at a national level. That's fantastic. Uh, I, I, I'm not blowing smoke. I mean, I really do enjoy my relationship down here. You know, I told the city manager, I live across the bridge, so I'm always down here. I mean, Rocks down here in Reddington or something. So I'm always, this is my little, everybody else seems to live in North County. I live south. <laughs> but we appreciate the relationship. Thank you. Appreciate your time and effort you put into our city. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Cap. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is the presentation on Tampa Bay Regional Resiliency Coalition Seminar. Good afternoon, commissioners and vice mayor. I was asked to give a uh, quick presentation on the um, Champions of Change Creating Resilient Communities forum that was held at the Regional Planning Council in February. And that was attended by me and also by Commissioner Weinstein. It was um, very informative and um, hoping is the kickoff to a lot of positive change and um, growth for the, for the region. It was a, a, there was a wide range of participants. There were 350 people present. Um, they were governmental leaders from throughout the region, including county and city managers, their planners, mayors of St. Petersburg, Clearwater, and Tampa, all of whom presented on a panel together. Um, Julia Neshiswat, who is the State of Florida Chief Resiliency Officer, was present. Um, at this point, the state hasn't developed specific policies. They're kind of in their listening tour mode. And she talked about the various places she'd been <laughs> and the fact that it was um, a very critical issue throughout Florida that people were um, very concerned about resiliency, the impacts of um, temperature, climate change, and sea level rise. Um, because as you all know, if you live on the coast, you know it's real. The water is coming. 
So we also had professors and consultants from the colleges and the universities, representatives of engineering, energy companies, and J.P. Morgan Chase were there, and representatives of cities from around the nation with resiliency programs. Um, some of the main issues that they addressed in the presentations <coughs> included the clean energy and resource reuse. So there's some interesting things going on, even uh, to the point of capturing gas that's produced by other um, other processes and methods, um, and then turning that gas back into new products that, that can be used on the market. So it not only keeps the gas from going off into the air, but turns it into something profitable. There's ways to use it. So they've got a number of those kind of initiatives going on around the country. Um, oops, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way there. Um, another one was the reducing the carbon footprint, and um, it was recommended that local governments could have their biggest impact on doing that by updating their own building codes to require more efficient structures. Um, curbing emissions, of course, was a primary topic because auto emissions still rank as the number one cause of greenhouse gases. Um, they're focusing on not only automobiles, but, but also um, airplanes. Um, and then, of course, the transit um, programs everywhere, those are actually kind of ahead of the, the curve um, compared to the other sources. It's because 60% of the public transportation vehicles across the country are now fueled alternatively. And they're, they're working on the um, local transit um, is working towards getting to 80%. The, there are advantages um, over time because the price of alternative energy is coming down. That includes natural gas, the use of batteries, wind and solar power. And because they're dropping, there are, um, of course, more and more opportunities for their use. And that comes because of advances and demands and growth. Um, the, some local governments that have their own facilities, especially energy companies, have long been active in the um, buyback programs. Um, the, first of, the first public utility to um, do that was here in Florida. It was at uh, Gainesville Regional Utilities. Another point was the affordable and sustainable housing. We don't always think of this in terms of resiliency, but if people don't have any place to live, your community is not very resilient. And there are many things that could be done. It's going to be a multi-pronged uh, approach to dealing with affordable housing um, because it actually becomes less affordable the more efficient we make it because of extra cost that goes into new technologies. So um, in terms of building, what they're encouraging is that um, housing be built with cross-ventilation, shaded outdoor areas, and rainwater collection systems. Um, the location along transit corridors and in close to employment areas is important because one of the things that we deal with, and not only for the support of transit, but also for making housing affordable, is the cost of transportation between where you live and where you work. That's actually part of your housing cost. And, and one, of the, one of the things that housing professionals have been doing the last few years is trying to encourage um, the lending community to understand that relationship, that that's part of the housing cost. So um, building smaller, higher quality materials is important, and density support. Um, if you, the local governments are looking to intensify density towards along transit lines and closer to economic, um, the, the uh, sources of their um, employment because they want people closest to where they work. There were many presentations from people throughout the community, um, including Miami Beach, who's had a really good success rate with increasing the or decreasing the flooding on their streets by new street and intersection de design that includes storage capacity for water underneath the intersections. Norfolk, Virginia has a very comprehensive plan. They have ranked the entire city based on the areas that flood the most and, not surprisingly, discovered that those were the areas that in its natural state were the drainage um, areas, the, the low-lying areas. And they have actually gone through the city and ranked their neighborhoods and areas based on their drainage capacity and based also all of their policies, their long-range policies on, on those drainage concerns. 
so that if you're in an area that, that is flooding, it was a, they designated as natural drainage and will no longer spend public funds to improve it in its current condition, but, but will um, put funds towards moving people out of those areas and restoring the area to natural drainage function. They've reduced um, a good deal of their flooding that way already. This is controversial and very expensive, as you can imagine. In the Netherlands, we all know them for their, their big dikes and dams to keep the water back, but over the years they've realized that's a never-ending and losing battle and so have begun designing to allow the water to come through and so that their houses are on stilts and some of the yards are built up, but they're intended to let the water come and go as it naturally will. So the attendees in the conference broke up into groups um, along certain topic areas uh, with, throughout the resiliency um, discussion, and then those groups created lists of opportunities um, and challenges. Those were then voted on by the entire um, group and put into an, a certain order. Um, we haven't received all the reports back yet, but I can tell you that some of the main topics or the top ranking topics were shoreline stabilization, transportation efficiency, and coordinating planning and natural, along natural drainage functions. And instead of coming up with land use distribution and development plans based on the kind of artificial boundaries of civic limits or neighborhoods do it based on the way the drainage and the water naturally flows on the land. There was also a regional grant for housing presented by J.P. Morgan Chase in the amount of $500,000 for the development of a regional resiliency initiative to, actually they're just more or less collecting data on um, the assessment of communities and housing, what can be done to make housing more affordable and resilient over time. And then moving forward, they will, uh, the regional planning council staff will be collecting all of this information. They've been told that those, the priorities would be um, sent out, made presentations to the municipalities to get input from all of you, and that they would use that input to create their, their low, the, the priorities for the coming year. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Was there anyone here that had any questions for her? No. I would just like to comment that um, two things were brought, I think, up that were really good, too. And I'm sure um, Linda agrees with um, the fact that uh, the, when the speakers were talking about different things, they were talking about the importance in a lot of communities after disasters, cat catastrophic um, things, how the resiliency is so much um, improved, how it, how it moves along, okay, when generators are available in that community, and especially in a community like Madeira Beach, um, where a generator on the premises of City Hall allows the, res the efforts to begin ever so much faster, okay, uh, more efficiently when the employees who would be on uh, call, okay, here, have a place to um, sleep, eat their meals after a, if a catastrophe were, were to ever happen. And I thought that was really interesting that in so many of those presentations by different communities uh, throughout America, they also uh, talked about the importance of having the generators. And then the other thing was that... Um, it was Kelly Hammer Levy. She's the one at Pinellas County, isn't she? Mm -hmm. Who, who I think coordinated the efforts with the city of Madeira Beach at that after the red tide um, right. of 2018. And I thought that was really cool too, because it was one thing that Madeira that Madeira Beach was, um, I guess maybe not a forerunner, but well, maybe they were the only ones um, on this part of the beach to coordinate efforts for the fish fish collection. Um, and that was talked about with several of the people. So it was interesting to note that our community is, is you know, really proactive and stuff like that. Yeah, thanks, Linda. Sure. Did you all have any questions? Thanks, Linda. I was going to open this up for public comment, if anyone has a comment. I 
good afternoon, everyone. Missy from the Treasure Island Madeira Beach Chamber of Commerce. Just reminding that we are hosting a candidate forum tonight here at 6 p.m. And all residents of Madeira Beach are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to close this segment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of this, the next item on the agenda is going to be updated numbers on the employee salary and compensation study. And this is with Karen Paulson. Hey, Karen. Good afternoon, Vice Mayor and Commissioners. Um, it was brought to my attention that possibly back when our previous city manager was here that some numbers were read out that m may have um, not been correct as far as our employee turnover. So we wanted to bring back some numbers for you to see um, that the memo that was written by Jonathan, um, you know, I can't speak to that memo. I didn't write that memo, so I can't speak to those. But I did want to let you know that I believe um, some of the numbers were because our commissioners and our seasonal employees are <coughs> included in our payroll. And when the numbers were ran, I believe that seasonal people were included in and. And so what we did this time is we went through and we um, excluded all the seasonal and commission, the five of you, from the numbers so that it wouldn't be skewed by um, the FTEs of our employee turnover. So, um, you know, I presented that, I brought that to you today. Um, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer any questions. Hi, Karen. Hi. Um, I really appreciate you working on this and you know just so we're clear please relax I'm not trying to catch you in something I just you know I'm, I'm really just really confused because I'm looking at two different memorandums here and we will get okay I got a couple of questions for you but they are almost diabolically different I mean they are we're talking about huge percentage differences right I mean I think we can all agree on that so I guess, you know, I got a couple of questions. So you, and you just kind of hit, hit on it. Um, you did write the current memo that we're looking at on page three, correct? That's yours, Karen, right? Yes. Okay, cool. And, but you didn't, you did not write the one on page eight. Um, I'm not sure I have page eight. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. The yes. Page eight is the one that uh, you're saying that Jonathan wrote right, on right. April 23rd, but you didn't, you'd never seen the document before. You've never had any, no. okay. Well, you, you, do, you do know your names on it, though, right? Yeah. I mean, I know I pointed that out to you. Um, it, Walter, your name's on it, too. Did you, did you write this memo on page 8? Or the... I wrote part of it, but some of the figures that are mentioned there came from Mr. Evans. Okay, okay. Truthfully, at this point, I, I really don't care who wrote it. That's not even... A, but fair to say... What the staff is saying to us today is that the memo on page three is the correct analysis, right? Okay. All right. So that's a good place to jump off from. Um, so subsequently, since they contradict each other dramatically, we are in turn saying that the one on page eight is incorrect. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, besides Karen and Walt, there are two other names on that page eight document. One is former city manager uh, Jonathan Evans, and the other is Bob Longmire, who was from the consulting company. So if you guys didn't participate in writing it, and I know Walt said he had a little hand in it, it's easy to draw the conclusion that one or both of these guys did, all right? So while I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth or, or, or try to catch anybody in, in, in something weird here, the one on page three that you did is now correct, and the one written by the guy that we paid $15,000 to do it is wrong. Okay, that's what, that's what the, you know, so that's why it's continued confusion for me. And also, Bob Longmire sat up here and he sat at the podium and stated word for word that the power during his PowerPoint presentation, then answered questions from me and a couple other commissioners about turnover. And he said unequivocally his numbers were verified. Okay. He also shook his head yes when I asked him that's really a bad turnover rate, right? Mm -hmm. So again, how did we get to this point where the numbers are differently? Well, the one thing I can say, and, and Karen, like I said, I do appreciate your work on this, but if we're looking at the document, the first glaring problem I saw is we're we're comparing different time frames. Okay. Yours on page three seems to be going fiscal year 17, 18, 19. The one on page eight is April to April time frame from 2017 to 2018. So since the time frames don't sync up, sync up it's really tough to do a straight apples to apples comparison. Um, 
But, you know, I, I guess my point is this. I, you know, I was called out on this a while ago, and um, as far as I knew, and I mean, Karen, you are a resident expert here, um, from April 23rd, 2019 until today, there's never been any other documentation or memorandums that have gone to the board that you're aware of, right? Right. So we were, it, it's pretty safe for us to assume that we were supposed to be taking that April 23rd document as that was correct, right? I mean, there's been nothing to the contrary to it. So I just want to make sure that everybody knows that what I was speaking to that day was I read it word for word. I mean, I, <laughs> I said slightly less than 60%. Slightly more than 30 percent in the two time frames that were given, and they were 59.4 and 30.3. Okay, I just wanted to make that clarification, and I thank yeah. you for doing the work on it, Karen. You're welcome. Did anybody else have any other questions, John? John, did you have any questions on this? Go ahead. I do have one question. You say on here, like on page five, six, and seven. You talk about uh, full-time um, employees terminated and full-time employees resigned. Do we know what department they were in? Yes, I have them. Can you tell us, you know, like, like the ones that were terminated, what department they were in, and ones that resigned, what departments they were in? What departments? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, did they work for sanitation, or did they work for the rec department, sure. or that? Um, for... For instance, for fiscal year 19, um, I'm sorry, fiscal year 17, two of the positions were from the city, city manager's office. Um, one was from REC, one was from the city clerk. Um, I believe the other was public works and recreation. And that was resigned? Yeah. And then um, fiscal year 18, one was from Public Works. Um, well, one termed from Public Works, one part-time turned can't remember what department he was in. Um, four resigned, two were from, three were from REC. No, four were from REC that resigned. And then four that, uh, full-time that resigned were fire, REC, sanitation, and parking. And then in fiscal year 17, two that termed, one was in building, one was in sanitation. One part-timer who was termed was in parking. Two part-time resigner resigned from rec. Four full-time resigned from city managers. Um, two from the marina and one from public works. And I think I have that backwards. This is fiscal year 19. Okay. Um, was from um, community development, I'm sorry. And then one retiree was from sanitation. Thank you. It's a little variety. Okay, was there any other questions up here? Thank you, Karen. I'd like to open it up to the floor if there's anyone who has a question on this. Okay, I will close that. The next item on the agenda is the amendment to fees ordinance, and this is with Walt. Um, Madam Vice Mayor and Commissioners, um, trying to get the fee schedule changed um, in lieu of uh, starting, and we've actually started part of the uh, FY 2021 budget development process. And I guess with that, um, I, we'd like to just focus briefly and give the directors an opportunity to um, basically maybe five minutes of some of their changes that they've highlighted. Um, this is still an evolving document. We still believe we have some cosmetic changes to make, but we wanted the directors to have an opportunity to um, mention some of their, um, some of the changes that they're recommending. 
I think Linda's the first one. Good afternoon again. I'm going over the community development section. We have some. Um, Can you give us page numbers as you do this, sure. please? Thank you. Okay. It's page 7 of 30. It starts the development services section. There are several places throughout this ordinance, the fee ordinance, where um, the staff, tip, well, the the document states that the fees are as follows, but if the review requires more time than that, then the, then the um, developer or whoever's sponsoring it um, has to pay additional cost over and above that amount. So it requires us to kind of keep an accounting of how much we're charging against each um, action or permit as it comes in. But it was described in several sections which is kind of dangerous because that leaves us the possibility that one of them gets changed or we miss it someplace or it's un uncertain how it's being applied. So some of the changes you see here, the bigger ones, are basically reorganization. And the intent here is to describe that um, permit fees are accepted, work begins once the fee is there because that's what makes the application a complete application. And that um, we will be charging time against that and services, whatever is required. And when that fee is exhausted, additional fees would be required in order to cover that. If um, there's more, if there's more put into an account, it turns out we don't require a whole nother fee. We can reimburse for that amount, that, that difference um, out of the second fee. Typically, we will be able to conduct the review within the first fee amount because um, over time I've been tracking how long each type, each action takes and have adjusted the fees in previous years to what I think is necessary to cover them. But as you know, some projects come in that require a whole lot more attention and it's our responsibility to make sure that the community is reimbursed for those services. So that's the intent of this. Just It does involve a lot more bookkeeping than we're used to doing. but. We've now um, adjusted our administrative processes to cover that. The only other um, change we've made for the planning activities is the, um, oh, or two others. One is the increase the, the rate, the hourly rate amount, uh, more in keeping with the actual cost incurred by the city for overall um, charge of an hour's time. And it's also then in keeping with the $100 per hour charge that um, the building department has been using. And then adding a fee for short-term vacation rental. Um, throughout my tenure, uh, we've been finding things, services that the city provides without any fee at all. And it's been my responsibility, of course, to find those and to figure out how much time and effort goes into each of those things. So again, that the the um, community is being reimbursed for its costs in the development process. So on page 11 of 30, you see that the short-term vacation rental certification process um, is now charged at $300. Okay. Um, and there are also changes um, to the, the values of um, our added Permit applications under the building section beginning on page 12 of 30. Um, if Frank is out today, I'll answer questions on those changes as best I can. Tamara's also here if you okay. have any questions. Did you plan to present? Those are, and then those uh, minimum fees are basically up as, as I said with planning, just updating the fees to take into consideration how long it really takes and what the city is really paying for its um, services from employees. And if there's no questions, moving into the finance area, which is uh, page 14 of 30, the only thing there is parking related. We have Sue here um, who can address uh, four of those changes. 
By the way, for those who don't know, um, Sue is our new parking supervisor, and she's doing a, a really good job. Thank you. Good afternoon. After doing um, some research from the neighboring municipalities, we just wanted to change uh, the parking fines from overtime parking from 25 to 40, double parking from 25 to 50, uh, parking in a no parking zone from 25 to 50, and other improper parking from 25 to 50. That it's, seems to be competitive. With that, that is competitive with the other municipalities in the area. Yes. And who, enforce, who enforces that? There is a constant parking abuse on in certain areas of the city and non-parking places. Who... Who do I tell people to call anymore? If it's on a, a residential street, Commissioner? No, it's on Pelican Lane. Which is behind John's Pass. Oh, behind. That, yeah. that would be, um, I'm sorry about that. That would be the, the Sheriff's Department. You can contact me, and I can get a hold of the Sheriff's Department for you. Um, they're constantly patrolling back there. That's more their area. Uh, parking department does the parking lots. At Archibald, um, this, uh, yeah, this is on the street, Sue. This is actually on the street, and it's—I mean—they're blocking traffic, but I guess they know who they're blocking. But they're blocking me getting in and out of the street too, and other residents and businesses. You know, I was just curious who. Yeah, who, the sheriff's department uh, does okay. enforce that, and I mean, our officers—if we do see something blatant—I mean, they they will, you know, go and, and ask them to move. Like, I know that we have a lot of tour buses that come in and drop people off. We try to direct them across the street uh, to make it more accessible for the vehicles to come through and explain to them to go underneath the bridge to walk to get to wherever they need. Because we understand that a lot of them are people that have a hard time getting around. So, yeah, we, we try to keep the, the road as open and flowing as possible. I had one other question. If you look at page 14 of 30, down at the very bottom, yes, is sir. that uh, the first um, item? It says 129th Avenue West and Gulf Boulevard. Isn't that the same as Johns Pass Park, or is it not? Th that is page Johns Pass Park. Is yes. it? Okay. Yes, Okay, because I noticed you had Johns Pass Park, and I thought, well, maybe there's another area I'm forgetting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, ma'am. Um, in the finance or in the uh, fire department, um, there's only one or actually two recommended changes. One is not on here on the page um, 17 of 30. Um, the CPR classes for non resident, because of the expense and that 25 figure has stayed the same for years, that's there's they're recommending that go from 25 to 50. And this, that change is not on here, but that's what they rec they recommended that after I submitted after I submitted this. And in E or section E on 17 of 30, they're recommending that to take out the EMS and just uh, fire rescue special event fee um, as far as a description. I guess with that, I'll turn Rec over to Jay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, beginning on 17 of 30 or 26 of 96, depending on, mine says both, but uh, I think it's on the same page y'all were just on. Uh, one, item one and two under A, um, we had softball registration and kickball registration. Uh, the idea here is to go similar to what our youth sports did, which was uh, we'll determine the rate by sport, uh, competitive analysis with the surrounding areas and cost recovery. Um, that said, you know, we can do six-week seasons, eight-week seasons, change it up and still, you know, charge a a rate that allows us to either break even or profit on the activity. Make sure that we're not losing money on anything we're, we're running. Um, on item number four, uh, looking to raise the after school program a dollar for resident and non resident. Uh, this would actually take place or take effect on August 1st, which would be the new school year. Uh, if we were to do it now, it would induce confusion, seeing as we have kids being picked up from school today. Uh, 
we would, you know, or whenever this goes active, we didn't want to do it immediately on them in the middle of the school year, uh, you know, family's budget and all that stuff. So this would be a discussion going into the next school year to allow them uh, to know uh, that this is a, would be a minor increase, but also to plan otherwise if they need to. Uh, but looking at the market and uh, competitive wise, where this puts us still in a safe place. Uh, the, the city, I, and I have to double check this, I missed this when we reviewed this. The, uh, the city employee rate, I believe in the past, we were discussing between after school and summer camp, and I think this is the one that we went and said that after school would be free for staff, uh, whereas summer camp was the resident rate. Um, I'll have to go back and look at the minutes of that, but that is uh, one thing that I did notice in here. Um, and then the last change was the on page 20 of 30. Uh, that is the sand volleyball court rental. Uh, we did a non-resident rate of 100. Um, since we instituted that, we haven't had a single rental. <laughs> so uh, the $20 fee is for four hours, and that, that is essentially just the time to prep it, reserve the court, and you know put the notice up for them. So uh, it's still a rate for the time that it takes us to go drop off a flyer that says that it is reserved, uh, but it doesn't keep people from reserving it. So. Any questions on those? Thank Thanks, you. Jay. Um, next is the public works, which would which actually starts on 22 of 30. And Jamie just has a few uh, corrections here. Uh, good morning. Um, so yeah, on page 23, um, the only updates for sanitation are the rates for additional commercial dumpsters um, increase five dollars. So they went from 45 to 50 for a one cubic yard. Uh, 70 to 75 for a two cubic yard and 100 for a three cubic yard. Any questions? Thanks. Thank you. And then lastly, um, we've got on page um, 28 of 30, um, the marina, Madeira Beach Marina. Brian. Good afternoon, Commissioners, Vice Mayor. Uh, First thing we added is a statement saying that we have a little bit of the flexibility to adjust in accordance with tax rates, um, specifically the rental tax rate. This year it went from 6.7% down to 6.5%, which took us from a round number of $150 down to $149.77. Well, people just don't write checks for that. So in order to keep it consistent, until this this board changes the uh, the rate, we'd like the flexibility to adjust the the rate that we charge people, so we can maintain the the after tax number the same, um, in accordance with any tax rate changes that happen in between when when uh, we do a fee schedule. So that's the first statement there, and and then also to give uh, employees um, the resident rate. And then we made a couple uh, updates to the fees. Um, for different uh, rates that we charge for uh, different, um, yeah, we're now down to page 29 and 30. Uh, we also added the uh, live aboard permit uh, to the very end. And per the resolution that was passed. Right. Pending any questions? Thank you. At this time, I'll open up to public comments to see if anyone had any comments on it. <coughs> yes, sir. Robert Preston, 425 South Bayshore Drive, Madeir Beach. Uh, one was just above. I guess the fire department providing the CPR classes. Um, most of the community that I had been in previous to this one, that was pri uh, provided as a public service because the more people that we had out there doing CPR, the better off our community was. And I think that when you charge people to take a CPR class, um, 
fifty dollars or whatever the case may be, you're reducing the amount of people that may be available to save people's lives. And I think that's the wrong direction to take as uh, a city as a public service is I think that should be done free of charge. That's just um, my opinion. It provides people more initiative to come in and take the class. Thank you. This does say for residents there's no fee. Pardon? There's no fee for residents. It's the non resident. The non resident was charged. Yes. On it, but the, the residents. Were not. But what's your take on that, uh, Bob? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how do you argue with that? I mean, what what, what do we charge somebody, a non-resident that's going for a CPR class? Is it in here? I, I missed it. $50? Yeah, it went from 25 to 50 for non-resident and free for residents. Yeah, I think I mean, the idea, you know, I don't want to speak on behalf of the fire department, but um, I think um, they were looking at the cost that it takes to um, to run and support that program. Yeah, we, we help assist them with, with hosting them, whether it's at our facility or here. Um, and in conversations with them, they, they essentially, the processing fee to get the card, uh, you know, once they, they do the class, they take the test, the information has to be sent off to somebody. There's a processing fee and all American that. American Heart involved. Association. Yes. Uh, so on the back end, there is a fee for those cards. So essentially, for the residents, without a fee, we're eating that cost. Uh, and then for non-residents, it's they're raising it to pay for the cost. It, it's... That's just kind of the mindset. And they didn't want to raise the, mm -hmm. the Right. Prisoners. And Jay, am I right in saying they do this every quarter? Uh, at, at, currently, they offer uh, CPR monthly. Monthly. We do once a month, uh, and they've been kicking around uh, evening classes and weekend classes as well. Because, again, you know, same mindset. I'm sorry. Same mindset. As many people as possible that have it, you know, um, it initially started, you know, a while back. We were we were doing it because we've got staff members that are required to have it. Um, actually, every one of them. But so it's increased, and, and they're getting a pretty good. You know, when we did it, we had four people with rec uh, two months ago, uh, and there was three or four public members that participated as well. So it's you know we're, they're, they're seeing a response, which is good. I, I think if the commission's okay, uh, this is going to if you, we move it forward, it'll be on the agenda for the March meeting. Uh, the fire chief's out this week, but I will make sure that he can see what numbers he can come up with for the costs, and then you all can make a determination if you want to eat that cost for the uh, non-resident rate as, as well. It's a point well taken. I think CPR does save, li save lives. It might even save ours one day. Okay, was there any other questions up here regarding this? I already opened it up to the floor, so I'll close the floor at this time. So I'll have that on the on the agenda for March. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And the next item on the agenda is for the fiscal year 2020 mid-year budget amendment. And again, this is with Walt. Uh, Madam Vice Mayor and Commissioners, um, wanted to do a mid-year um, budget amendment, um, kind of to uh, get the budget sometime in order on some of the things that that the commission has already uh, approved and are, are aware of, some not. Um, the first two items, um, the, um, and I have the, an Exhibit A, and by the way, these, this amendment affects the general fund, which I'll cover first, then the building and then stormwater funds. And the first general fund is the, uh, the FDOT resurfacing Gulf uh, Boulevard project, which it was an amendment that was approved by the, or it was part of the agenda, uh, consent agenda at the last meeting, um, and they increased the, uh, the total uh, cost to by $100,000. And this is a pass-through project, meaning that the city will get back um, all of the money that's, that's spent here, spent on this project. And I will say that recently we submitted um, a $60,000 um, request 
to get reimbursed for administrative time or administrative cost as well. The, uh, the, so those are those first two entries recording the revenue and the expenditure for that increase. The third one is the um, final payment. This was sort of a little bit of a surprise to us in the finance department. Um, we got a bill which was the final payment um, for the Crystal Island project, which most we thought most all of the expenditures hit last year, but this drifted into this year, um, eleven thousand eight hundred, and um, so that would that would be uh, that's the final bill on that. That and was that, on the bridge repair, correct? Yes, that's the bridge okay. repair that was approved by the board last May fourteenth. Um, the fourth item is information we got from Clara that. Um, the clerk's office needs to do um, some crucial scanning to keep up to date with mandated state statutes. And the person assigned to help Clara, um, we have the total um, cost that would that would generate, which was six, it, which is six thousand three hundred fifty dollars. The fifth item is. Um, Something that I indicated to Jay that we would do, we took in money um, for the uh, Veterans Boat Parade, and really that, that money is targeted for particular use. And so in the past, we've always taken and put it in revenue, but here um, we're actually increasing Jay's, um, Jay's promotional account so that he can best use these funds for what the intent was for. The uh, sixth item is the building fund. The building fund is due to increased projects um, becoming more dependent on safe built ins inspection <coughs> support, which is a consulting service. And um, that is 33,000 that we're putting in there. Don't see a problem with that because we've run projections that show based on early revenue um, actu actual amounts that this fund will, uh, revenues will exceed expenditures by at least $200,000. So that shows you the increased projects that's taken place to justify this need um, for this additional service. And then the last one, this was the uh, construction administrative services by dual that the board approved at the last meeting um, for the Crystal Island project, 198,700. That's coming out of the stormwater fund, and this will go against the uh, the 15 million dollars that's that's earmarked for that project. Okay, is there any questions up here regarding this? I'd like to open it up to the floor if there's anyone out there who would have something to say about this. I'll close the floor. Madam Vice Mayor, uh, yes. uh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say so if everybody's okay with that, I'll put that on the uh, agenda as well yes. for next year or uh, next meeting and reference the consent. Okay, the next item on the agenda will be the transfer of the city investment funds from Synovus Bank to Hancock Bank. Again, this is Walt. Um, Madam Vice Mayor and Commissioners, this was an item that we presented at the last meeting to the board just as a, an option for the board to consider and based, based pretty much on the amount. And the board, um, um, some of this is, is kind of too good to be true as far as the, the rate and what we would earn. And the board directed me to provide additional information on both banks, um, which I have I tried to include a corporate profile for each so that you could, you know, get a little bit familiar with what the bank was, um, what, what, the, what the bank makeup is, and basically how well each one did for 2019. Um, both banks are good banks. Um, Synovus, obviously, through mergers in the last couple of years, is bigger. Um, but we've had good, very good experience, um, very good um, support and service from Hancock, and Hancock does have um, 
bank representatives that are dedicated to public funds and um, are very proactive. So, again, two good banks, and that's why we have their money there. Walter, do we have anything in here that, I mean, I don't care where you put the money, to be quite frank. And I mean, it's great that they're offering us this rate. It, it, you keep using the word guarantee in here, and I like the word guarantee, but do we have that in writing anywhere? Does, are guarantee, guaran guarantee from the standpoint, Commissioner, that it's a fixed rate for three years at 2.43%. That is in writing. We did get, and that is actually part or within the banking contract that the board approved um, back in, I believe it was uh, May time frame. And so that, from an interest rate standpoint, that is guaranteed. Okay. Just provide us that contract when we, when we vote on, at the next meeting. And I'll I will. Thank I will. You. Thank you. What I, like is, what I really liked about it was that the um, Hancock-Whitney is either government-guaranteed, government agency-sponsored, <coughs> or high-credit municipals. I, I thought that was a very important thing in my I guess, decisions or, you know, ideas that it's probably a good move. Thanks. Okay, okay the next time, well, let's see, no more questions up here. What about anyone in the audience? Would they like to make a comment on this? I'll close the floor. The next item on the agenda would be for the RFP for the City Attorney Professional Legal Services. Mrs. LeClaire. Uh, when the Board of Commissioners approved the extension of the contract for the uh, City Attorney on December the 10th, they had also requested that staff move forward with putting an RFP out, which the City Attorney can also put in a bid, and the City Manager tasked me with finding an RFP and we went through it and everything together and then we want the Board of Commissioners to look at it and let us know if there's any changes you would like made or additions, subtractions or whatever you want to do because we we can get it in the paper. Well, I, I'm a little disappointed in the time frame. This took entirely too long. Um, Clara, why were you, you why were you tasked with it? I don't, I don't understand. I think that John made a motion and and it was tasked to the city manager. Is the city, I, and Bob, I'm not trying to step on your ground here. Are you supposed to be tasking the city clerk with something? I'll, uh, I'll address the question. Clara said through her sources that she could get the information and turn it around quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. That way I can get one on there uh, without it waiting so long. It just took a little longer than I thought it was going to. I, I figured these are, we've got hundreds of proposals out there, and, and I thought we could have gotten this spun around quicker. But, okay, let's push forward. I'll, we're good, Clara. Don't, okay. it, it's, it's fine. Uh, Vice Mayor, I have go ahead. a couple of points. Um, if we go to page 59 of 96, it's the, the introductory information. Um, I would just suggest, I guess, for better clarification, that the uh, paragraph, the second to last paragraph on that page 59, instead of saying the city has a contracted uniformed police department, I, th I think we should identify it as the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, um, if that doesn't pose a problem. And also, the city employs approximately 57 regular time, full-time employees and about 18 part-time employees. Um, I mean, it shouldn't be approximately and about, I wouldn't think, but I always, I, I had looked and I thought there were 65 regular full-time employees and 65, and oh, 65.35 and 6.65 um, part-time for a total of 72. And that was in a memo that I got from you, Walt, and I'm sorry I didn't have time to call you before this meeting, um, but I'll tell you where it, do you, do you know that information? Or can we just check on it, please? Okay. Right, I'll send that back to Karen. She okay, yeah, let's just check too. on it, okay? Yeah. And uh, then the other question that I had on it was um, under page 63 of 96, where it talks about the general scope of work and conditions for the request for proposal for legal services. And our handbook, our 
commission handbook that was passed in May specifies that the, uh, that the city attorney should be our parliamentarian. Um, it says, let's see, there's zero in the charter, but the Board of Commissioners Handbook of May 2019 says the attorney shall act as parliamentarian to the Board of Commissioners by advising the mayor regarding matters of procedure. And I've asked this question before, and I don't remember if I didn't get a reply, but I know that our city attorney doesn't necessarily do that. And I think that because we've had quite sometimes rather uh, not contentious maybe, but meetings where it's gotten very confused as to what the proper parliamentarian procedure is. I think we should either consider uh, in our request for professional services having a city attorney that will make that a part of the scope of, of legal services to provide to us Board of Commissioners. We need something. No comment? You can put that into the general scope of work and conditions on page 63. Provide parliamentary advice to the Board of Commissioners. I, I do think it's necessary as we go forward. I, I would like to see it. You can put that in the second paragraph at the end. That's where I put it. I'll be in that second sentence, at the end of the second sentence of the second paragraph. Were there any other questions up here regarding this? Okay, I'd like to go ahead and open it up to the floor if there's anyone out there that would like to speak on this. Okay, close the floor. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and put that in the second paragraph for the city attorney. Vice Mayor, did, did we have a consensus on that? I think it was just we, Commissioner Weinstein was the one who wanted it. We can take a consensus as far as I'm concerned. It's fine. Okay. Um, just want us to call it out to you, or did you want to call? Oh, well, no. Well, okay. Just That's fine. consent to change it. Okay. That's what the purpose of this is today. Okay. All right. Yeah. Just point of clarification, um, do you want to review it like on the consent agenda at the meeting for this think, or if yes. we make these changes? Yes. Okay. Yes. I was hoping Karen was here. I wanted to ask her a question, but she's gone already. You That's were saying okay. put it on the consent agenda? Yes. Or well, if we make the changes that you all want, we can either send it out and get mm -hmm. the process going or we can, if you want to review the document once it's changed. I would like to review the document once it's changed, please. Okay. Yes. Okay, I'll then, put it on there. Good. Okay. All right. Is there anyone out on the floor who would like to make a comment on this? Okay. I'll close the floor. Okay. The next item on the agenda will be uh, Gary Robinson, attorney agreement. Oh, that'd be the same thing, wouldn't it? You know, it's a little different. It's Gray, it's Gray Robinson, okay. and this is for the uh, labor labor attorney engagement letter. I think it was on a prior agenda, okay. and it was pulled, but we put on a workshop right. for discussion. Okay. Okay. So at this point here, the letter we received from um, the labor attorney at that time. Do we need to do anything with that at this time? We don't need to do anything with it. So. If there's no discussion, we can put it on a regular meeting okay. consent agenda for approval. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I personally think we should go look for another labor attorney, to be honest with you, but it's up to you guys. Do you want to add that service to the RFP? Or yes. See what they offer? I think that would be great. Yes. I, think really, I really think that we should, you know, at least explore our options on that. All right, the next item on the agenda is the, ooh, the banners at John's Fast Bridge. You can okay, put that agenda. out for public comment before you move on to the next agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I guess we do need to talk. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Come on up, Bob.
Ellen Price, 13319 Boca Ciega Avenue here in the beautiful city of Madeira Beach. Um, definitely we need, in my opinion, to find another labor and employment attorney. I just want to remind you all that um, the same firm, and I believe it was actually Mr. Gonzalez who signed this letter, actually presented a letter to a board of commission a couple of years ago actually giving permission for one for a city manager to have a relationship with his secretary and still supervise her and give her days off and set her rate of pay and things of that, which was bad, bad, bad. And I don't think anybody here will agree, would agree to that sort of thing. Uh, and the second thing, I was here at a meeting one day and we were talking about the handbook and Mr. Gonzalez sat over here and um, was asked a question about some language that was in the handbook and he said, oh, I was just attending uh, the meeting, uh, just, you know, just uh, observing. I didn't give any legal advice, which I thought was, my jaw dropped. I thought the whole purpose of him being with the committee that we did our handbook was to give legal advice on how to make the changes and make them legally. So I don't know if Gray Robinson is really the firm we want to go with in the future. Okay, Bob. Robert Preston, 425 South Bayshore Drive. Um, as far as a labor attorney, you're going out for request for legal services. Is there not firms that provide that as well? And it shouldn't. It should be in part of the RFP that's going out for uh, that Claire is putting together. That the labor attorney needs to be part of this RFP for attorneys so that it puts it on them to provide the appropriate. So you're basically stating that the attorney that applies for the job should have the experience behind him. So when he fills out the application, he could put down the information? Is that what you're asking? Well, you're, 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 you're asking for a request for proposal for legal services for the city, correct? OK, correct. So in that proposal, why doesn't that include the labor, the law? There's firms out there that provide this stuff for the city that has all those areas that you need. And I think it costs you more money to go out and get this guy and this guy and this guy than to go to one firm that are out there to provide you that service. And then you're not getting nickeled and dimed you're basically saying someone maybe has an experience under their belt already. They already have that. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. You're right. There should be. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, I mean, we've had, we've had communication problems in the past with, um, you know, our outside attorneys and our inside attorneys haven't been talking very well together, and it's just been... You know, and then everybody's pointing fingers at the end. It, it, Bob's 1,000% correct on what I've always envisioned, and this is no disrespect to Ralph. I like Ralph. But, you know, having a firm that handles all of our needs, and if they have to go outside and get a specialist on certain things, I get that. That's, that happens. But having a firm that's talking internally at their firm on how to best handle our city, I think that's the way we need to go. We're getting bigger. There's a lot of money at stake right now, and um, I think we you just got to do this intelligently. Thank you. And you get a single point of contact is, is more than anything, instead of having multiple contacts for multiple attorneys. It gets convoluted. Thank Thanks, Bob. Was there anyone else that wanted to speak on this? Okay. I'll go ahead and close that with the floor at this time. The uh, next item on the agenda is Jamie again <laughs> on the banners for the bridge. Uh, good afternoon, Vice Mayor and Commissioners. Um, uh, there was a request at the last meeting to give an update on the banners on John's Pass Bridge. Uh, the city had banners in the past, and um, regardless of how thick the material, what kind of like double stitched oyster holes, um, the winds just caused the banners to be ripped and. Age very quickly. 
Um, they were replaced at most, or they've lasted at most six months at a time. Um, so it's something we could do, but each order of banners is $1,600. So we're looking at best case scenario. Again, the prices could have changed in, since they were originally up there, but it's just replaced very often. Jamie, do you know if, um, I know you're in charge of this, but did you have the opportunity to call other companies to see what they have available? Is there anyone else out there that would do the same thing? Um, we haven't reached out to any different um, sign fabricators, but when, when we went out and looked at the current light post and um, to also check to see what the Treasure Island banners look like, because I know that's what brought up the initial conversation, um, it looks to me that their banners are also having the same issues. The bottom um, horizontal post is, it like wobbles. So I don't, we could reach out to different suppliers, but I'm not, I'm not confident that it will have any different results. Yeah, I remember some of these conversations pretty vividly when we were doing this in the past, and uh, there's no real, and that wind whips through there. It, it, I mean, it's, it's not even funny. The only thing I would think of is maybe there's an idea of doing maybe some type of permanent signage, uh, like an archway into the city going over that bridge or something like that. I don't know if we'd run into the same issues there as far as like a steel sign or something like that where we could have something a little bit more permanent. Then it wouldn't be $1,600 a shot, one big permanent sign, and, you know, just kind of something like a, a, at the gateway to the city. Just something to think about. I mean, I know we've talked about it at the other, on the, on the Tom Stewart Causeway as well, so um, I'd be up for a discussion about that someday. I think we could probably, especially with all the new things that are going on here, it would kind of be cool to have. We can look into it. Thank you. Jimmy, before you leave, I do have two people maybe you can contact also who does the same thing. I know it's not our job to do it. I know it is yours. But if you don't mind taking down their name and number, Maybe giving them a call, too? Uh, sure. Okay, I will. May I comment, Vice sure. Mayor? <clears throat> yes, I thought about this item and uh, then the, the next item on the Johns Pass Village update, so I don't want to get ahead of myself, but if it's going to cost $50,000 for these 16, I mean, 14 light poles and to change it out at least twice a year, I mean, we're talking $45,000. I'm sorry, the, the memo actually had a typo. It was for the the memo had a typo in the total the total cost was 1600 per order not oh, per sign okay. yeah that, that, well and i'd rather put that money into the thing that i've been begging for for the last two years which is the, yeah. the cosmetic improvements on the uh i thought that's a lot of money okay get on to the next one then <laughs> okay was there any other discussion on that at this time i'd like to open it to the floor to see if anyone out there would like to speak on this no? Okay. You know, Nancy, I did have one, one question, and that sure. was for you. Oh, I'm this. sorry. I thought when you originally were asking for the banners, you were talking about them for, like, up by the middle school, by the mm -hmm. school versus the John's Pass Bridge. John's Pass. Weren't you? John's Pass. Okay, I, I misunderstood you. I thought you were talking about coming in from over Tom, from, from Tom Stewart in that area. Okay. If we had them on, on one post, Vice Mayor, wouldn't we, wouldn't we put it consistently on the other? I mean, on the other bridge, we have the two bridges. Well, see, what it was is what we had on, on our side. We had the sign saying, welcome to Madeira Beach. You know, it had a real nice picture. But then on the other side of the street, as you're leaving Treasure Island, going into John, uh, Tre um, Madeira Beach into Treasure Island, you are now leaving Madeira Beach. So that's how the signs were before. That's I thought they were that way on the the walk over bridge from walk over, the school. Oh, down there. Oh, my yeah. goodness. That's what I thought you were talking about when you asked about the, was that walk over bridge, because we used to have signs on both sides, yeah. right. you know, entering and leaving. Yeah. So, okay. But you'll check into this for us. And again, like I said, I have two different names and numbers if you're willing to call. It's totally up to you, okay? And then yeah. we can go from there. And I opened it to the floor, no one wanted to speak. So we'll just go ahead and put that on. Do we put that on the agenda for the meeting next month? The uh, banners for the John's Or should we Pass just put Bridge? it on the workshop? On the workshop. Well, we're at our workshop. So if you want to 
the commission wants to move ahead with it, sure, I'll put it on the agenda and you know, I'll try to find the money for it somewhere. I'd like to do it. I don't know how the others feel about it. Is that a yes? It's a yes? What does John say? John says yes, too. Okay. I guess I, I would prefer putting everything we've got into the <laughs> facilities at John's Pass Village, but that's that's it's part of it bridge. anyway. It's just the bridge. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, thank you. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and pass on that and go up to, uh, I guess, you, like you said, Bob, you'll put this on the, on the agenda. On the, on the agenda. Right, we'll next. do up a proposal okay. for the total cost and, okay. and uh, have it for your approval. Okay, sounds good. Okay, the next item on the agenda is for John's Pass Village update. Hey, Jamie. Hi. Um, so the staff does a, agree that John's Pass Village does need um, beautification, and it is a very focal part of the city. However, priorities in the staff's opinion is that public safety should be prioritized um, at this moment. So there are a couple of projects that we feel like our higher priority um, right now instead of the sit wall and benches as we discussed. So at this point, who so you're at saying? The, at this point, we will, it's on our list, but it is, it's not, if there's money remaining from at least two projects that we have kind of tabbed out now, um, addressing the boardwalk and um, addressing some tripping hazard issues or potential tripping hazards within the village. Okay. And then if there's money left, then we can look into um, revitalizing the village image. Okay, so at this time here, as far as the Jones Pass Village update, everything we need to, need to do down there, we're not going to do anything yet until we have the additional money to do it, is basically what you're saying. We'll, we'll have to budget for it in a, in a future year. Okay, all right. Vice Mayor, I've been really working on this really very diligently since before 2018, and I understand and I respect where the new public works director is coming from, but I've walked this village for, I mean, I've walked the village um, with everybody from Dave Marsicano and Deb Laramie and Bob Daniels and Jonathan Evans and Linda Portal and and, and Jamie and Design Concepts and Al Carrier, and we really did decide um, uh, previously, I understand how important the pilings are also, Jamie, I'm not discrediting that at all, but as a, as a commission, we decided to go ahead to begin the um, functional updates. Um, the Many of the benches, those steel benches, the rust is showing right through them. Mm -hmm. um, the trash cans are just get falling apart. And, you know, my main objective really is to provide a better experience for people that come to John's Pass Village. We always talk about how important John's Pass Village is in the county and uh, to our visitors and to our residents and businesses. And I, I don't want to wait on it. I, I want to know, I mean, I think that we need to have a better plan than waiting for and putting it into a capital improvement program or waiting until we have something we I, I just feel like we really need to um to go forward with a with a plan instead of just saying oh we'll bring it up or we'll put it in the capital improvement or we'll wait until we do the pilings um this was a very important function and i think that in order for our our village to uh, uh to strive to attract uh, more tourism and better quality of tourism whatever i think that it's our responsibility as commissioners um to make sure that we Get this this program and get this program started. Commissioner, I agree and, and disagree with you in the same light. I, I do agree that stuff has to be done, and I think that that's part of the project that um, Jay's kind of carried on. When I was back, when I was working here, you know, we were working with the Village Merchants Association to form a partnership, a real partnership for the seafood festival. And we were going to take our proceeds after, you know, our proceeds, cover all our costs, take our proceeds, and start bump, dumping it into the beautification of the of John's Pass. And I think that there's a caveat in this year's agreement, right, Jay, that 
um, a percentage of the money that comes back from John's Pass has to be put into that fund. So I agree with that totally, and it should be done. Um, but we've we've had hang-ups with this with this deal with the Merchants Association for a while. I'm not going to get into the reasons why, but there's been a lot of hang-ups for it. On the second note of that, though. Um, you know, the last thing in the world that we need, I know people don't like uh, steel benches that are corroded, but they're going to have, they're gonna, it's a heck of a lot worse for the boardwalk to fall into the, into John's Pass, into the water. And some of those pilings, I, I, I went down and, and looked at them with, with professionals, and they are not in good shape. So that is definitely, and I agree with Jamie a thousand percent, that is priority number one. Let's make sure for the safety of the people that are in there, and then, like I said, I think we can work with the Merchants Association. We can work within, you know, if that, this is a really, really hot topic for you, I, I, I do suggest we put it on a real workshop and let's workshop it and figure out a way to find out, find some money in order to make these replacements that you're talking about. Because I agree with you. I agree with you. But not at the risk of, of taking money from a project that is mission critical at this point. How, how much was the, uh, I, I thought the piling thing was on the budget last year for like $27,000 or something. So that's not a humongous amount of money. Is it gone to $175,000 or $125,000 or what? So these funds rolled over from last year. We took them from the BP fund improvements 75,000 and to replace the pylons 31,600 we've already made a payment um, I guess um, city manager is more aware of this than I did we've already made a payment against that 31,000 already yeah that was the initial inspections okay so we already are moving forward on that yes okay well I, I still think that the it, it the, the redoing of John's Pass Village should not have to wait until the, I, I'd just like to exhaust everything that we've got to make sure that we can't move forward with at least checking the, the seating and the, the uh, trash bin. Nobody else thinks that way. That's okay. I can, just, can I, I'm just pushing it. Can I just proffer something if I may? Jamie, can we uh, get a, our quotes for the pilings? at a time so we know exactly what those costs are and then maybe we can uh, you know work on the trip hazards and that and have some money left over that we can at least start the sit wall and, and trash yeah, can that's project. Part of the RFQ that we have out currently um, I was going to have a full inspection not only of the pilings but of the, the stringers, the boardwalk, the handrails, the entire thing as a whole system and that part of that will be uh, developing repair plans and that will have a cost estimate associated with that um, and that's why I didn't want to I, don't, I, I just wanted to have before going forward on committing to another project make sure that we have the money available for the boardwalk before starting you know because I don't I don't want to run short on money cause, so yes once once we get a quote for the RFQ then we can start some preliminary designs any type of a time frame the submittals for the RFQ are due March 10th I believe so so the summer maybe roughly yeah. okay. I agree with, I agree with Doug on this the safety has got to be the priority mm -hmm. Chairs are nice and all that, but I think, you know, getting the, the pilings and, and the trip hazards on the boardwalk fixed have got to be the priority. Well, I agree. I, j I just thought there was really enough money for the, certainly the, the pilings. Will there be any, is that all on the city or is that, are all of the pilings that we're talking about city pilings? We will only be repairing city piles, yes. Oh. Pardon? We will only be um, Repair. repairing okay. the city piling, yes. Um, there are some private ones that are bunched in there, but we're not going to be using city money to repair those. Then will those all, okay, that brings up one more question. I, I know that 
but since you're talking about the pilings, um, so does that mean that those boring worms or whatever they are can get into what's not fixed? It's possible, yeah. Well, Jamie, they also put that protective coating right around it so that they can't, you know, so the penetration of that is nearly impossible for them. So, yeah, I mean, it. I got a, I got a pretty good <laughs> education on it one day, and uh, yeah, it's it's some scary stuff. So yeah, let's let's make sure that you know. I'm glad that that's uh, the RFP is going forward, and we get that thing taken care of because that is not a way to. And that's not one reason why we want to get on the news. That's for sure. Is there any other questions up here? No? Okay, I'd like to open it to the floor. Let's see, go ahead, uh, go ahead, guy. Jack Ritelli, 13025 Pelican Lane. Well, we were talking about the boardwalk. I was uh, the, one of the original pay some for the boardwalk. I'm still standing here on the property there on the boardwalk, 40 years. Even uh, so, on the village, we pay for the border royalty and the big parking lot. Lots of the money that they come in the, from the parking lot and the board of royalty that they got rented to the t-shirt people, the profits are supposed to stay on John Space and beautify John Space and pay for piling like to the boardwalk. But they put the money in the general funds. So now we got to scramble to get money. How are we going to pay for the piling? How are we going to pay for the hazard? Well, if we go back and say when the court says the money is supposed to go there, I don't know how they got passed, that the general funds for John's pass will go to all over the city, to the general fund of the city, that's okay. But now we cannot find money to, to spend it for John's pass village. That's what I'm, I'm getting mad. I'm getting mad in a sense because... I am one of the original still here that I pay part of for the, the boardwalk and the parking lot right there on that village. I got notes, I got bills, I got everything. I pay 17% to Bank of America now when I was CNS Bank for the loan. 17%, guys. Believe me, you know true, it's true. I don't know how many people there are here that they can tell me that. We pay for the land, all our property owner from the village. I don't like to hear we got to find 35000 to spend it for the boardwalk because it's unfair. We have to find a way for the village to be Safety for everybody, even so that I live there in Madera Beach, on, on, the, on John Spence area. I'm a resident in Madera Beach. I own the property for 41 years. I'm still here. I don't go nowhere. I hope not. But the village was, John Spence was the, the, the core and the beautification of the whole Madera Beach and the whole county. How many people know that the county know what a beautiful Madera Beach is and was and still is today. But nobody believes in, in spending 35, 50, 150,000 beautifying Madera Beach. Madera Beach beautify John's pace. Sorry. But we have it to do something for Madera Beach. It's the whole Madera Beach. I don't talk me that I live there. I'm talking about the whole picture of Madera Beach. Because when tourists come in people's homes and the whole city, what do they bring? The, oh, let's go to Madera Beach. Let's go to the boardwalk and take an ice cream or, or, or eat in a restaurant. Please listen to and, and reflect and think about <laughs> that that's the beauty of the whole county, not just Madera Beach. Go to the county, maybe get 100000 in you know, from the so that we get to uh, repair the boardwalk. I mean, it, it's a whole county comes over here to John's Pass, the whole state. 
Maybe we can get a grant to half a million dollars for repair the boardwalk and find a way to, to do something about it and the whole village and, and the garbage on Pelican Lane and, and everything else. Thank you very much for listening today. Thank you, John. Bob, did you have something to say? Robert Preston, 425 South Bayshore Drive. Um, yeah, the safety items are key number one. They need to be done. The city can't afford the liability of 50 or 100 people falling in the water. They just couldn't afford that. Um, the other thing is, it really kind of amazes me, especially the, the rust on the metal benches or whatever the case may be. I'm used to city maintenance departments that did maintenance. So where's the four inch grinder with the wire wheel on it and the paintbrush? You know, is that something that our maintenance people can take care of to help beautify that? I mean, I don't understand why that can't be done in the maintenance department. That's why we pay a maintenance department is to take care of stuff like that. Take care of garbage cans. So I, I, it's beyond me that stuff like that, we have to have somebody else do it rather than our maintenance people. It's beyond me, sorry. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? I'll close that. Um, at this point here, we're just going to go ahead and put this on the agenda for next time. Or? Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so, sounds good. Okay, and the next thing on the agenda is the update on SWIFT mode funding. Again, that's with Jamie. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to give the commission an update on where we stand for uh, SWIFT mode funding for Area 3 and Area 5. It's been an uh, ongoing discussion for several months now between the district and the city and our uh, consulting engineers, Dual and Associates. Um, it's, we're going for similar fundings that we had used in the past for uh, 137th and Boca Ciega. Um, the difference is this past year in 2019, um, Swift Mud has changed their matrix and how they rank projects, and that has put the area three and area five above their um, thresholds. So we've been negotiating with Swift Mud and then um, to try and come to an agreement on them giving us money for something rather than nothing. And they met and presented the project to the regional committee February 13th. Um, during that meeting, uh, our project was ranked last. Um, it was ranked, so it will be going on to the uh, final approval April 8th and the staff is basically asking for guidance uh, from the Commission on committing to pervious pavement if we get funding or if we want to withdraw our application and go to a conventional pavement design for the areas um, the cost of difference is I'll just use ballpark numbers because we're really early in the process um, so they might fluctuate a little bit um, if, if we got co-op funding with pervious pavement, we're looking at roughly 4.67 million. Um, and for a conventional pavement without funding, we're at 4.5. So we're roughly 100 and 170,000 difference. So we're just looking whether we're going to commit to pervious or if we're going to go with a conventional asphalt design. Jamie, um, 
the swift mud funding though will be pay for half of the difference of going to the Cor correct um i didn't it's it's in the memo i don't want to get in that little of detail right now well i know but when you, sure. if oh. you just look at it it sounds like we're only getting a hundred thousand more to do the uh the so, paving, but with their help, we're able to do that project for only 100,000 more, correct? Correct, yeah, correct. 100 so, change. Um, it's, it's broken down in the third attachment, I believe. Um, they, the agreement was that Swift Mud would pay for 50% of the difference in cost of previous pavement versus conventional pavement, and also the um, conveyance systems. So the new stormwater pipes and drains. And the total cost would be 2.2 if you broke those out separately. So the city would be responsible for about 1.1 and um, Swift Mud would be reimbursing us 1.1 also. And the main difference is the their uh, matrix have changed because the governor ordered them to remove more nutrients out of the uh, stormwater uh, before it gets into the uh, into the rivers or into the bay and uh, So that's why our projects started ranking lower. There was no nothing No change that we made. It was just that they changed their matrix uh, per the governor's directive So at this point here are you asking for a general commission or um a vote on this or what are you looking for at this time so I uh, we need as a city we need to decide whether we're going to commit to using previous pavement and if they accept our or if we get approval for the funding we we do not need to change our mind at after that point so we need to decide if we're going to spend the extra money and get pervious and keep our fingers crossed for getting the uh, grant approved, or if we just want to go with conventional pavement right now and save, again, assuming we get it, the difference would be 170, 180,000. That is what we would say, you said. Is that what you just said? If we did the project without funding with conventional asphalt pavement, it would be around 4.5 million. 4.5. Okay. If we commit to going with pervious pavement and get approval, the total project or the total city responsibility will be 4.67 million. So we're still going to be paying more, even with funding, if mm -hmm. we get pervious pavement. Well, the pervious, the pervious is definitely worth it if we, if we're willing to. I mean, if we're going to do the maintenance on it. I mean, I think that. You know, the people in the Boca Ciega area, I mean, it's right around my store, I hear it all the time. Um, if we don't bring the street sweeper down there and free up those holes so we can drain the water, you might as well just do the, the regular pavement if we're not going to take care of it. So um, I don't know how many, how, how they, and I'm certainly not putting it on you, Jamie, I don't know how many times, you know, a week or a month or we're, we're running that street sweeper, but that's... You know, as, as rainy season comes, I mean, we're going to see how good the pervious pavement is just based on the fact of whether the, the holes are you know, clogged. Uh, is that pretty fair to say? That's fair to say. And we have added additional staff, so now we do have more flexibility to allow for um, that to be done on a more routine basis. And ever since that member has been um, with the city, it's been a pretty consistent two-week. Um, okay. And we haven't really had any major rain. I don't remember any major rains in the last couple of weeks, but um, I guess yeah, time will tell. But I mean, as far as I'm concerned, let's wait and see what happens in April of 2020 before we pull the trigger on anything. If we get the funding, then we get to make our decision, right? I mean, we 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 got to so kind of commit that, to it right away. That's kind of the crux yeah. of it. If we get approval, we That'd have be too to go easy. <laughs> so I'm sorry. If, if if we get approval, we have to stay on the pervious track. We, we don't want to, you know, backtrack after all the negotiation that the city and um, our engineers have gone through with Swift Mud to then just get approved and then turn around and say, never mind. So just wanted to give you guys a heads up that, you know, we're working on it, but we just wanted to see if the commission was 
fully on board and committed to it, knowing that we're still going to be a little bit higher than a conventional pavement design. Can we use pervious in that payments. area? Yes. Yes, because those it was both turned down for Crystal Isle. Correct. Both of those areas have had geotech, and they do. Um, they are suitable for pervious. I have a couple of questions, um, and it's going back to the history with the Bogusiega and then 137th also. Um, Bogusiega has been totally finished for about two years now. It's finished in, in 2018, and I think probably maybe even some of the problems are starting now with it. Um, but I'd like to know. How long, how long does the city have a warranty on the work that was done, for instance, on Bogusiega? And do we have a report on it? Do we have specifications that show that the pervious is, was a good surface, was, was a good idea, okay, was a good deal? Because I've heard nothing but terrible things about it, I guess. And I've heard things, for instance, about we're talking um, about the future projects of Parsley Drive, Marguerite, and then um, 129th, 131st, which are in horrible, horrible shape. And when the inspectors came to those areas and made those three-foot squares, okay, to determine if Pervious was an acceptable method, um, I thought they came back and said no. They said, no, you're going to get asphalt. You're not going to get impervious. I mean, you're not going to get pervious. And I thought, wow, that's good because... I'm not sold on the pervious, I guess, uh, but I would like to know, I guess, number one is, is there a warranty report on that pervious, and what does it say in Bogus Diego before we make any further commitments? Um, I'm pretty certain that it's a 10-year it's a warranty, and the um, contractor was just out a month or so ago looking at uh, some of the issues on Bogus Diego, and they're going to come back and do some spot repairs where some of the um, pavement has popped up. Okay, so you said it's a 10-year warranty? Wow, that's a long warranty. I'll double check, but okay. I'm pretty sure. So I think it would be important, I would think, since we've used two different contractors, we use Keystone on Bogus Yeager, and then we use that Steve's to actually do the work on 137. And and I, I mean, I, I don't know that certainly the people that I've talked to are any more experts than... For instance, the the warranty is on the pavement itself. So pavement itself. The okay. pavement itself. So not the it, labor. It, the warranty is not with um, Steve's excava excavators or I forget the other one you had, Keystone. It's with um, the previous pavement. Um, do you remember? Do you remember what the company's name was? Okay, but still we need to get more um, information to be able to make an educated get uh, educated statement whether the pervious is the way to go since you I've heard so many different stories on it that's all I'm saying <laughs> okay so at this time here basically what we're doing is just kind of giving it some thought as to what we're going to do next we're not making a decision today correct I it's the Deadline for the so the concern is if we don't withdraw and we get approved, but we the commission decides that they want to do standard or conventional pavement, then we're kind of stuck. You know, so I just wanted to give you guys enough heads up to think about it and you know put some good thought because this is a big decision. Um, so. Like I said, April 8th is the final committee meeting to approve all projects. So if we, don't, if we do not want to do pervious, we need to decide before April 8th. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions up here? No? Okay, I can open it up to the floor to see if anyone out there. Just uh, appreciate Chuck Dillon with 
his input as a volunteer construction <coughs> committee member, I think that's important and, and having some of that outside is a help to, to the city staff. But having observed um, the Boca Siega area and um, the drainage issues and all that was underway, I appreciate what Commissioner Weinstein's saying that there have been a lot of people who have been disappointed with the fact that that roadway is extremely noisy. Um, it has required a lot of maintenance. There have been problem areas, and I'm glad to hear that, you know, we've stayed on top of it as a city to, to get them back out to make corrections. Um, but, you know, all of the extra work with that pervious surface, with the trucks, with the employees, and, you know, I just caution that you all get all of that information in order to make a decision. It's great that it percolates. It's great that SwiftBud participates, but if you have a surface that is not going to last, is noisy, is not compatible with the neighborhood, um, those are my comments. Thank you. Ms. Bob. Sorry to bother okay, you guys. That's okay. Sorry. 13025 Pelican Lane. I work in pair previous concrete. I am the one who did many, many jobs in many places on the beach area too. Indian Rex Beach. Call Indian Rex Beach if you're happy. Previous concrete works in not on the beach area. The reason why we have a lot of wind and blue sanding. The wind, I mean, it's. It's it's a it's a case that, that you go against the uh, the previous, because if there is a wind, the storm comes from the beach area and the sand that blow all over the place, you have to get the machine right away before rain to soak the water, uh, the, the sand out, because once the sand goes in, there's no way you're going to take the sand out of the previous. So you plug the holes. It's concrete mix with uh, many rocks, no sand, and they make the previous. If they mix all right, it's good, but if they don't mix all right, it's not good. Also, have, you have a problem on Boca Ciega. It pops up. And the heavy equipment, heavy trucks, back and forth every day, Con uh, just like a garbage truck, they're going up, and I'm going to hold. Thank you. Hey, Bob. Bob? Robert Preston, 425 South Bayshore Drive. First of all, I'd like you to move this mic right here so people don't have to go like this. And then you probably hear people. It's been a problem ever since I've been here. This thing's been built. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't have any skin in the game for pervious or regular pavement. But if you do pervious pavement, you need to do it with a holistic approach because that's not happening on Boca Ciega or any place else or even on 137. And that is, is that you have people that are doing construction, you have people that blow their yard waste, their sand, their dirt into the street. You have oil that goes on the pervious concrete that collects the sand. That's an environmental thing, and you can make them fix their trucks or cars that are leaking oil on the ground. If you don't take care of all these things, that pervious concrete is worthless because it will be plugged over time. And like the gentleman said, we get a lot of sand. But we have people that continue. You see it in even contractors that blow all the stuff into the street. And that goes into the previous concrete. And then we have to vacuum it out. And like the gentleman said, you have to keep on top of it. And we have one piece of equipment. And when the wind blows, we get sand. If you look on your cars, it's dirt and sand. That's going everywhere in the street. And it's constant getting packed. I mean, somebody drives over it. So you really need to look at the holistic approach to it. And if you're going to commit to pervious concrete, then you need to commit to making people do the right thing 
as far as their construction materials, as far as their oil leaks on their vehicles, and uh, their cleanup. I mean, it's it's a holistic approach. Thank you. Chuck Dillon, 529 Lillian Drive. You four people and the next mayor and Bob and Jamie all have my commitment that I will go through this. And if it has to be a special meeting a few days before April 7th, I will give you my opinion as to whether or not it would be advantageous to do the pervious and to make some ideas about before I did not really believe in pervious pavement. However, the way I understand Boga Siega, we got two and a half million dollars from the Swift Mud money and we put two and a half million dollars into it. There is, a, granted we're in a sand community, however there's eight inches of clean rock underneath that six inches of uh, open graded concrete. I haven't been completely outsold of the pervious. However, you have my commitment that by beginning of April, I will let you know what the recommendation is from my standpoint as a city um, resident and what my knowledge will be as far as whether or not it will be advantageous for us to go with the pervious pavement or go with the standard asphalt pavement. My commitment. Helen Price, 13319 Boca Siega Avenue, here in the beautiful city of Madeira Beach. I, uh, let's not forget the whole reason why Swift Mud is going to give us $4 million to put down pervious concrete. It's for environmental reasons. It's to help capture some of this stuff before it dumps into our bay. Um, I think for the little difference here, less than $200,000, I'd say go pervious. I've got it in front of my house. Um, my road is really, really dry. Um, maybe I just lucked out there, but um, I've seen other areas and the roads are slick or, or really wet and there's a lot of runoff. I don't get that. And I don't blow my trash into the thing because I did realize they came by and kind of educated us on um, you know, not doing that kind of thing, so I don't. But it, it does take maintenance, obviously, and, I, and I'm glad we have the truck to do it. And since we have the truck to do it, um, I think we should try to use it everywhere we can. It is loud, though. I got to agree with Doreen. Um, the seams, if there's any way in the future they can make the seams a little bit closer together so we don't hear this, crunk, 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 you know, the tires going over it, uh, that will probably make the, the future residents a lot, a lot more happier on that end. Thank you. Thank you. Was there anyone else that had anything to say on this subject? Okay, I'll just close it for the floor then. So this will go on to the next workshop, excuse me, the, uh, the meeting, the regular meeting. I'll work with Jamie and we'll come up with a recommendation memorandum, Jamie and, and uh, with Chuck, and uh, you know we'll come up with a recommendation for you and then you can Vote it up or vote it down. Okay, so. thank you. Thank you. And the last thing on the, on the uh, agenda is the employee involvement in political activities. And this is with Commissioner Andrews. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I brought this up in the last meeting and, and it's really a subject. It, it's you know, I'm too close to it because I, I had some issues last year with this, and um, I brought up the incident that happened this year. Um, we had a charter officer that made an unsolicited phone call to a candidate um, to discuss, you know, something that to clear up something that he had heard on the on the um, campaign trail. Um, you know, it, it did not, I don't make the rules here. This is state rules. We got it in our charter. Um, I think that there's been some misinformation that's been given out to our employees. Our employees, especially the resident employees, when they're off when they're off the clock, they can hold signs. They can get signatures. They can 
do whatever the heck they want, um, as long as it doesn't filter into their work time. But if we have, and we had this happen last year too, um, you know, if we have people that are getting involved and making unsolicited phone calls and to different area people, you can, and you know, I mean, you can affect an election. And frankly, I mean, we're better than that. We don't need that, and especially on something. You know, what it was, it was about was, you know, it, it was a let's just say a, a disagreement as far as numbers, okay, um, and a perception of how things were being calculated. I, you know, again, it's against charter, it's against the state the state statute, and I just don't think we need this in our, in our in our lives. And I, you know, and I think part of the problem was last year when it happened, and it was proven that it happened. I got an email stating that it happened. There was never any retribution. There was never any. There was there was no, um, uh, you know, no penalties, no days off, no you know, no even slap on the wrist. Um, in fact, it wasn't even. It, at the time, that city manager wouldn't even investigate it. Uh, so, you know, this one is a little bit more close to home. This is one of our, our employees that did this. And, you know, I, I think, think, you know, we just got to air this thing out and let's make sure that this doesn't continue to happen. That's two elections in a row. I don't know if it's happened before that. That's two elections in a row. It just doesn't sit right with me. Madam Vice Mayor, I'm um, just for Commissioner Andrews, uh, knowledge. I, I did do some preliminary uh, investigation. I'm back on it now that I'm done with my surgery and I will be meeting with you to let you know. Okay, thanks. Okay, is there any other questions up here on this? Okay. I'd like to open it to the floor if there's anyone out there that'd like to say anything on this subject. Okay, thank you. There isn't anything on. Did you have anything to report? No. No. <laughs> but thank you for the support while we got it. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. It's. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Claire. Um, I had questioned the, the elections office if they could uh, possibly get the results, the final results of the election finalized early. And they said no. It says, uh, as mentioned below, the deadline to file official election results is March the 29th, 2020. I would use this date as a guideline due to the un unpredictability of the election results. As always, we will get the results out as quickly as efficiently as possible. Okay, we're planning for Tuesday, uh, March the 31st for the swearing in. And I would like to know about what time you all would like to have that. See, we're going to have just a regular meeting that night, and we do the agenda meeting ahead of time. Normally, that's a workshop meeting, um, and my proposal is that we not have a meeting other than doing the swearing in. So it would be a special meeting that we would have mm -hmm. to swear in the, uh, the candidates, or not, I'm sorry, the board of commissioners, and uh, that way. You know, we can take pictures, enjoy the moment, and we get into business uh, in April. I'm sorry, Helen, what'd you say? Oh, is it? Okay. So we're keeping a regular schedule next month. Okay. Right? Oh, no, I'll I, take I don't that know. back. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I don't know. Are we, are we doing a workshop? We That's are going to do a workshop, and we're going to do a regular meeting on... First yeah, week. It'll okay. Be, be like so we'll just, I need your permission to call the special meeting to do the swearing in then on the 31st. 5th 31st. Tuesday. Right. Good to go. Okay. So um, we six six o'clock. We're going to go six o'clock. Six o'clock. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. A meeting is adjourned. 414.